morning. Meron na po? Wala. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me uh, in the New Testament in the Gospel of Mark. We're looking at Mark chapter 4 and verses 26 to 29. Okay? Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. Let us hear now God's word. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produced sorry, the earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. It's Good to be back. It's good to see all of you again from this vantage point. You know, in the introduction to his book, Center Church, Tim Keller describes two competing paradigms used for assessing church growth within evangelicalism. These two paradigms are, on the one hand, the successful paradigm, and the other is the fateful paradigm. Now, the successful paradigm is more concerned, as, as Keller describes it, with quantifiable numerical growth. So the question you're trying to answer is, uh, what can we do to bring more people in through the front doors? Ah, I know, better coffee more practical and therapeutic messages. So that's a successful model. Now, in reaction to this, there's the fateful paradigm. And the fateful paradigm is really the fateful, not successful paradigm. It is more concerned with doctrinal purity with integrity. It's more concerned with getting the doctrine right and doing church by the book or doing it rightly. I'm struggling with this. Okay. Now, Keller, however, he says that such approaches, the fateful paradigm approach, often tends to fall into the danger of a thoughtless traditionalism. This is how it's been done. You know? So, so we were, we we're just going to keep it this way. And, and we know churches like that, even within the Reformed tradition, right? They do essentially the same things we do, but they're not growing. They're saying the same things we're saying, but it seems like they're just preaching to the choir. Now, we have a term for that. We call it dead orthodoxy or even dead orthopraxis, right? because the practice is, is mere traditionalism. It exhibits a veneer of incompetent faithfulness. Now Keller proceeds to offer a third paradigm for evaluating church growth. And this is fruitfulness. It is not enough that we should be faithful, no, not successful. Okay, so, so anything that, that the successful model is doing, we, we, don't, we don't need, we're not here for the numbers. We're here for, for, for faithfulness. We're going to do everything the right way, the way it's been done for hundreds of years. 
Now, Keller says, no, there's a third option, which is, he thinks, and I, be, I, I agree, the more biblical option. It's faith, fruitfulness. Biblically speaking, our faithful efforts must bear good fruit. This is the objective purpose of the church's mission. Fruitfulness. A full harvest of souls. The gathering and perfecting of saints, as our confession of faith puts it. Now, as we turn our attention this morning to our text, we must bear this in mind. This is the aim of church ministry, that we bear much fruit. So the more helpful paradigm for ministry is neither success at all costs, nor faithful, not successful. Instead, it must be fruitfulness. This realization brings with it both a challenge as well as a comfort. You see, this is the challenge. We need to be fruitful, but we are powerless to cause any real spiritual growth in ourselves, let alone in others. You see the challenge. As a church, we're supposed to bear much fruit. But as sinners, as humans, we have no power to bear fruit. But I said it's not just, it, it brings with it a challenge, but not just a challenge, but also a comfort. The comfort is that true spiritual growth, the kind of fruitfulness that the Bible expects and that we should desire is only caused by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. And there's the comfort. God can and is pleased to grow his kingdom from seed to full harvest. This is what he's doing. And so this morning, the word of God is teaching us that since God alone is growing his kingdom, that's his work. Our responsibility as Christians, drawing from the imagery of this parable, is to be faithful gardeners who prepare ourselves and prepare others for the harvest. I have three key points that I'd like us to consider this morning. Number one, we cannot grow... I'll use this instead. <laughs> Technologically challenged tayo, so mas home, mas old school. Ayan. <laughs> it's, it's better for me. Um, so number one, we cannot grow fruits for the kingdom. Number two, we are called to be faithful gardeners. And number three, we must prepare everyone for the harvest. They all start with the letter P. So the first one is power. Power. The power to bring forth fruit, the power to grow is not ours. It belongs to God. Okay? Power. Number two, period. Period because the second point is we are called to be faithful gardeners. Period. Full stop. Okay? <laughs> And number three, we must prepare everyone for the harvest. So the key word there is prepare. Okay, power, period, prepare. So let's look at the first point. We cannot grow fruits for the kingdom. Now friends, this parable which Jesus, Jesus tells in the hearing of the crowds describes the mysterious way that a seed sprouts and grows. The word, the word that's used there is automatically, by itself, automatically. The man here scatters the seed on the ground, 
So we're assuming he's a farmer or a gardener. He sleeps and rises night and day and with no special intervention on his part. The seed that is buried in the ground sprouts and grows. But verse 27 says, he knows not how. That's how the kingdom of God is like, Jesus says. Now, there are a lot of things that science can tell us about seeds, the anatomy of seeds, what the parts of it are, how they function. We know that when the conditions are right, a seed that is planted in soil will germinate, will sprout. It will fulfill its purpose of growing into a plant. It will mature. It will bear leaves, flowers, and if it's a fruit-bearing plant, it will bear fruit. You know, there's this YouTube channel. I don't know if you watch it. Um, I, I sometimes watch it to enjoy. The channel is called Box Laps. I don't know if you know that. It features time-lapse videos of different kinds of seed, you know, plants, growing from seed to maturity. And it's a fascinating thing to observe because if you've ever tried to observe the growth of, you know, those of you who are plantitos and plantitas, you have your plants. Have you ever tried to observe the growth of a succulent plant? Just stare at it for an hour. It's boring. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Or at least it seems like nothing's happening. Now, box laps is very interesting because they condense, you know, months of growth into eight-minute videos. And so you're seeing the plant, you know, from seed. It's, it's, it's dancing around. It's growing. It's shooting leaves. Until finally, there's fruit. And all in eight minutes. I love it. I, you know, I, I watch videos in succession in my free time, you know. It's... It's wonderful. It's very relaxing. But in contrast, you look at, you know, plants growing in real time. It seems like nothing's happening. But a healthy, healthy plant, we know, is always growing. But how do we actually know? Well, you sleep, you wake up, you sleep, you wake up. You sleep, you wake up, and then suddenly you see in the garden, oh, look, there's more leaves. Oh, look, there's caterpillars eating those leaves. Um, and, and, and there's fruit, right? But it happens over time, and you're not really doing anything special. I mean, very involved. Sure, you know, you might water the plants. You might clear the weeds. You might soften the soil aerate it, you know, make sure that it gets enough sunlight. But really, you're not the one that's making it grow. It's growing on its own. And we don't know how it's happening. That's what Jesus is saying. The reality of organic growth can only be described but never really understood, let alone caused by humans. And just as it is with the physical growth of a plant, so it is with the spiritual growth of the kingdom of God. We do not have the power to bring about the miracle of growth. I think growth is a miracle. Life is a miracle. Because it's really nothing, you cannot replicate it. You can observe it, you can describe it, but you cannot replicate life in a laboratory setting. True growth, whether physical or spiritual, can only be caused by God. Only God has life in himself. Earlier I heard the term as I was walking in, God is autotheos, God in and of himself, life in himself. And therefore, only God can give and sustain life. If there is any true growth, 
it is from God. Only God can cause a dead sinner to be born again. Only God can change a sinner into a saint. And that's the comfort that we have as Christians who are tasked with preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. This truth helps to define the kind of Christian ministry that we ought to have as a church. See, if we cannot bring about the spiritual realities of life and fruitfulness, of conversion, of sanctification and holiness, if we cannot bring this about, you know, through our machinations, through our schemes, if we can't bring it about, if we cannot even make ourselves more holy, then the pressure is off, if you think about it. See, the church growth movement, it's, it's actually a lot of external pressure because you have metrics that you're trying to meet. Oh, by, by, by this time next year, we need to have X number of people pray to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, we need to have um, all of these seats filled up. We need to have um, X additional number of Bible study small groups and life groups. And it's all, you know, so how do we do that? How do we, how do we get to, you know, uh, okay, I know, I know, I know. Uh, people love food. We got to have food, you know. We got to have um, freebies. We got to have air corn. Uh, we got to have popcorn, right? So it becomes focused on how to lure people in, right? Now, all of these things I mentioned, nothing wrong with that. We're not going to get rid of the aircon, not in this heat. We're not going to get rid of food for lunch. And I hope the seats, you know, they're plastic. That's all we can afford. But I hope they're comfortable enough for an hour or two, right? But that's not the point. But if we're thinking along those lines, oh, I need to be the one to convert. I need to, to make this dead sinner come alive. Friends, we're not Dr. Frankenstein. The pressure is off. If we realize we can't really bear fruit on our own, we can't really grow the church on our own, that it is only God who can do that, then the pressure is off. God is the one you see who is growing his kingdom. He is the one who is saving sinners. He is the one regenerating them, giving them new birth, giving them faith, converting them, causing them and causing us to grow in Christ-likeness and in service to him and to others. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 to 7, for those of you who remember, there's this issue in Corinth. They're, they're taking teams, right? I'm Team Apollos. I'm Team Paul. I'm Team Jesus, all right? <laughs> and, 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 and what does he say? He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Don't miss the point Paul is saying. Look, you and I, we have human responsibility, right? That was also mentioned earlier. Because we're not, you know, full determinists, ah, okay, fatalists, okay, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No. We have a responsibility. We need to obey. We need to preach the gospel. We need to pray. But at the end of the day, it is God who gives the growth. 
Many of you here are above 40 years old. <laughs> no, sorry. Many of you here have been Christians for decades. And if you look back on your Christian walk and your Christian growth, sure, there might be one dominant influence in your life, one person who really invested in your life. My own experience, it's different. There have been a lot of people who have invested in my life who have spent time with me, who've, who've guided me, who've led me. And at the end of the day, it's just as Paul says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. I am where I am now. Yes, thanks to all these people who taught me, who spent time and, and energy and resources on me. But at the end of the day, I am where I am now. By the grace of God. He is the one who grows us. He is the one who converts, who brings new birth, who makes us more and more like his son. Which brings us to our second point. We are called to be faithful gardeners, period. Oh, kids, the period there is really... We're called to be faithful gardeners, period. Okay? No more, no less. Jesus' emphasis in this parable is on the fact that God is the one that grows his kingdom from seed to full harvest. The power is his. We must never make that mistake of thinking, oh, look at our pastor, he's a powerful preacher. No, the power is his. And I'm not a powerful preacher. I'm very conversational. Okay? <laughs> the principle of life is his. Now, the man in the story simply goes about his ordinary tasks, you see. In fact, until the grain is ripe and the harvest has come, we are told that he sleeps and rises night and day. Now, of course, this does not mean that he was idle and that that was the only thing that he did. As the farmer or gardener, he's also very hardworking because when harvest comes, he's, you know, he harvests. But as the farmer or gardener, although he knew that he could not cause the actual growth of his plants, still he fulfilled his responsibility. He watered it, you know, he loosened the soil, removed the weeds. We can assume that he faithfully did the ordinary things that you would expect of a farmer or gardener to ensure the growth of the plants. So what's he doing? He can't cause the growth, but he is ensuring that the growth is unhindered. He's removing the things that would hinder the growth. That's what, essentially what farmers and gardeners do. I mean, you cannot, have you tried? You cannot speed up the growth of a plant. You cannot, if you're trying to do an experiment at home, kids, you know, you start with your mungo seeds and then you put it in wet tissue paper and wait for it to sprout. Next day, ooh, there's a little tail that comes out, right? And then it's growing and then you, trans you put it in a small pot, okay? You cannot be impatient with it. You cannot say to it, I want you to grow. I want you to... And then you squeeze it. You, you bear fruit. You. Mm. You can't do that. Right? But what you can do is you could drive away pests that might prey on your plants. You could ensure that it's well watered, that it gets good air circulation, gets good sunlight. That's the same when it comes to the Christian life and to Christian ministry. The reason why we are committed as a church to an, what we call an ordinary means of grace ministry is because we recognize that our calling is to be faithful gardeners. Promote the growth. We cannot make it grow. Just promote it. Period. We cannot bring about the extraordinary and we shouldn't even try. We cannot cause a new birth. 
We cannot preach about, I mean, we can preach about it, but we cannot make anyone believe in Christ. I, I can hold you hostage here and preach to you for hours on end until my voice is hoarse, but I can never change your heart. I can never make you trust in Jesus. I can never make you see that he is your greatest need, the greatest love of your life. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so we must focus on the ordinary and leave the extraordinary to God. Ordinary means of grace. That's the means. We focus on that. But then the results? Only God can do that. And the same is true, right, for the Christian life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 states that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, the morning light, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. This is the trajectory, this is the direction of the Christian life. A healthy Christian will continue to grow in godliness and will continue to shine brighter and brighter until full day by God's grace. A healthy Christian will continue throughout his or her life to be renewed from one degree of glory to the next until Christ be formed in him or in her. Now, our experience tells us it's not a straight line. Right? Point A to point B. Christian life often is um, three steps forward, two steps back. Right? But the direction, the trajectory, it will keep going and going. And if you want it to be straighter and straighter, that line, what do you do? Well, you be a good gardener. You remove the things that will hinder growth. You promote the growth. As a church, God has given us the preaching of the word, the sacraments, and prayer as ordinary and public means whereby we can pursue that end of growing the church, promoting its growth unhindered. So what does it all mean for us? You might have already guessed I will say this. It means that as individual Christians, and as a church, we must make diligent use of these means, these means of grace. This means that we must be present on the Lord's day when Christ is pleased to summon us in order that he might bless us. That goes back, when you say present, it doesn't mean you're here, but you're dozing off. Right? Being present is really being there. So it means if you need to sleep earlier, sleep earlier. Don't watch one more episode. <laughs> right? It means being present on the day that the Lord summons us so that he might bless us. Now, some of you perhaps are thinking, look, I come to church, I get Bible. I go home, I have Bible. Why come to church? Right? I can read on my own. I've been reading since grade two. Right? Sure, you can read the Bible for yourself at home. And this also, to a lesser extent, could be described as a means of grace. God does use that to bless us, to grow us, to sanctify us. God indeed uses many different means to grow us in godliness and in holiness. 
However, can I say this to you? Reading the Bible for yourself at home during your or during your family worship or even when you are attending your weekly CDG to read the Bible together in a group, that's not really what the Reformed tradition means when it speaks of the ordinary and public means of grace. Properly speaking, the ordinary means of grace are covenant assembly activities. They are activities that are done within the context of the gathered church. The public reading and preaching of the scriptures on the Lord's Day to a solemn gathering of God's covenant people is unique. It is unlike anything on this earth. I'm not exaggerating. And this is what we must make diligent use of. The joyful and believing participation in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, these are ordinary means by which the Holy Spirit brings about our growth. The joining together of our hearts in prayer and communion is designed by God as a means to maintain our spiritual health and to promote our growth and fruitfulness. We must never forget there are seven days in a week. You think back to the creation week. There are seven days, but there is only one day out of seven that God has set apart and that he has blessed and that's his day, the Lord's Sabbath, which in our time after the resurrection of Christ is Sunday, the Lord's Day. The way I like to think of it is, you remember that hymn, we sing it sometimes, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's a beloved hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And then the second line, tune my heart to sing thy grace. When you think about the Lord's Day, when the covenant community gathers in answer to, to, to God's invitation and becomes a covenant assembly, we're really gathering so that the Holy Spirit, through his appointed means, might tune our hearts. I'm not a musically inclined person. I don't, I don't play any musical instruments. But I, I get the sense that that's what tuning is, right? It's 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 getting it's getting the the tune right, <laughs> right? So that it's not out of tune. But why why do you need to tune your instruments, right? You come here on the Lord's Day, those of you who are playing the piano. I oh, sorry, not the piano, we don't tune that. The the guitar. You, you you tune it, right? Because you know, when it is subjected to use, it 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 it, it loosens, you know, the it, it gets off key. You know what? The Christian is the same. You're like an instrument. And you go you go you go to work. You know, you um, go to school, you interact with other people throughout the week, and you can also get off-key and out of tune. And so when we come together on the Lord's Day, God has actually giving, given us tuning instruments, and they're called the ordinary means of grace. We come to the supper, we come and hear the word preached, we come and join our hearts together in prayer, the Holy Spirit is doing what? He is tuning our hearts to sing God's grace. Last point. We must prepare everyone for the harvest. Now, verse 29 describes the triumph, the victory of growth and of life. It's unstoppable. Life is life. It, it will keep on living. 
if it is unhindered. Look at verse 29. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Brothers and sisters, the seed's objective is fulfilled at the harvest. The sprouting and growing, the production of blade then ear, then full grain in the ear, has all led to the aim of the whole gardening enterprise. The grain is now ripe, and the harvest has come. Now, spiritually speaking, this refers to the last day when the kingdom of God would have grown from seed to full harvest on the day that Jesus returns. What this tells us is that the harvest day is surely coming. You cannot stop it. The harvest day will come. It is sure and it, it, it cannot be stopped. Now in Joel chapter 3 verse 13, there's a description of this day of harvest. However, there it is described as a day of reckoning for evildoers, for unbelievers. Let me read that to you. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Now, Prophet jo Joel talks about the harvest day as a day of judgment. A day of reckoning. Now you combine that imagery with the imagery here in verse 29, which is a bit more positive. So that's the negative aspect of, of the day of harvest. And in verse 29, you get the positive aspect of the day of harvest. And we learn that the harvest day actually teaches there will be two kinds of harvesting when Jesus returns. Actually, there will only be one harvest. But for the enemies of God, this harvest means judgment. While for believers, this harvest means welcome. The day of harvest is coming. It cannot be stopped. And on that day, you and I, either we will be subjected to God's judgment or to the Father's welcome. Now, in view of this, what then is left for us to do? Well, we must prepare for the harvest, right? We must prepare everyone for the harvest. On the day of harvest, there will be two options only, judgment or welcome. And for those who are found in Christ, the day of harvest will be a day when the Father welcomes us fully into his kingdom, that we might enjoy our master's rest. But for those who are outside of Christ, there will only be just judgment for sin. And the way to prepare then for the day of harvest is to know and to believe the gospel. Brothers and sisters, the good news for all of us is this. Although we are powerless to cause life and salvation in ourselves or in anyone else, God is the one who saves. It's, it, it's a good news that God is the one who saves. The good news is that although we all deserve as sinners God's just condem condemnation, yet because of his rich mercy and because of his love, God has himself made a way for outsiders like us to be part of his kingdom. Jesus took the judgment. He bore the condemnation on the cross. And this is the good news and the reason for his coming. The reason there is any comfort for believers on the day of harvest is because Jesus has already received in his own body the judgment that is due us because of our sins. On the cross, as it were, Jesus harvested in his own body 
the wrath of God that is coming for his people. Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins of his people. He did this because this is the only way to ensure a full harvest of salvation for those he came to save. And so here is how we can prepare for the harvest, okay? If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then you must examine yourself. Paul says, test and see if you are in the faith. Do you really believe these things? Do you realize that your role in the Christian life is not to make yourself more holy, but to devote yourself to the ordinary means that God has ordained for your growth in holiness? And so come to church. Prepare yourself to sit under the preaching of God's word. Make diligent use of these means of grace. Participate in the sacraments by faith. Pray earnestly and heartily with and for your brothers and sisters here. Seek by God's grace to share the truth that the harvest is coming. Share this with your loved ones and your friends. If, however, you are not a believer, perhaps you're here because you are seeking answers. Answers to crises and confusions that bear down upon your life. Maybe you want growth. That's why you're here. You want to be a better person. You seek meaning and fulfillment. My friend, can I say to you, what you are seeking can only be found in Jesus Christ. The good news is that God alone can save you and forgive your sins. If you will today recognize your need for Jesus, if you will today repent of your sins, if you will abandon all exertions, all attempts to perform, to earn salvation, and if you will come to Jesus by faith, if you will believe the truth that He alone can save you, He alone can prepare you for the day of harvest. If you believe that today, this moment, He will save you. He will make you part of His family. He will forgive your sins. He will welcome you as His own. And on the day of harvest, two options, right? Judgment or welcome? Because you have put your faith in Jesus, on the day of judgment, he will welcome you. And he will say to you, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's rest. So I urge you, if you've never made that decision before, today, if you hear the voice of Christ, do not harden your heart. Turn to him. Repent and believe in him. Because only he can do it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the great comfort we have in knowing that it is you who are growing your kingdom from seed to harvest. We are grateful for the privilege of joining you in this great task of preparing everyone for the day of harvest. And so we pray, help us to be faithful and bold in preaching the gospel to the unbelievers that you bring us into contact with, whether at home, at school, or in the workplace. Father, it is your will for us to grow into Christ-likeness and fruitfulness. It is your will to grow us to be fruitful, to be more and more like Jesus. And so we pray that you will, by your Holy Spirit, enable us to make diligent use of the means of grace, to be present on the day that you summon us. Cause us to understand the unique privilege that we have in sitting under the preaching of your word, in participating in the sacraments that you have ordained, for our nourishment 
and in joining our hearts in the prayers of your faithful saints. We ask, O Lord, that you will help us to be faithful gardeners. Help us to seek to rid our lives of the sins that can hinder our loving communion with you. And prepare us always for the day of your harvest. Dear Lord, we pray that we may be found faithful on that day because you, our Redeemer, our Master, and our God, are faithful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.